Welcome back to ECS TV viewers. Chris Nichols here from the camera store and today Jordan and I are in the great outdoors to play with the brand new Sigma 50 to 100 1.8. Now we're looking at this because you guys asked for it. You know very recently we talked about what we like to shoot personally and right now Jordan's big into the 18 to 35 1.8 and the 50 to 100 1.8. These very interesting zooms with ultra wide apertures. Now we've talked about the 18 to 35 in depth. Today we're going to look at this, take some pictures of flowers, see what we can find out here in the woods and uh, tell you what we think about this very interesting lens. Now, it's important to understand that Sigma as a company have grown huge in the last few years. I mean, they've always been around forever, but they're really seen as a budget brand lens. These were the lenses that you would buy if you couldn't afford Canon or Nikon 70 to 200 and 24 to 72.8s. But now professionals prefer a lot of Sigma lenses, especially their art series primes, the 35 1.4, the 50 1.4. These things are amazing wide open, beautifully coated, interesting designs, and professionals and enthusiasts are loving these lenses. Now, of course, when it comes to zooms, it's so hard to break that 2.8 barrier. The only company that's done it before is Olympus, but now Sigma have the 24 to 35, the 18 to 35, and now the 50 to 100. Now, of course, we got to keep in mind that these lenses here, the 50 to 100 we're talking about today, are made specifically for the APS-C sensor. We're going to talk about how that all plays along when we compare it against full frame glass, but Sigma's just grown so big as a company and it gives us some very interesting features and some very interesting options that we didn't have before from the big manufacturers. Now, if you watch the show, you know that I do love mirrorless cameras, and it's not just the camera design, it's the smaller sensors, the smaller system overall. I shoot micro four thirds, I like the tiny lenses, it gives me a lot of advantages, and that's one of the keys here. I mean, APS-C, having a lens like this gives us this a very interesting wide aperture, and we still get great image quality. You know, I don't think that full frame is really that much better than the APS-C sensors anymore. The gap narrows, and that makes APS-C cameras a very viable choice for a lot of people's photography, which kind of brings brings me to a complaint on the 50 to 100 because playing with this first off we're not quite getting a 70 to 200 in full frame terms right we're getting 75 to 150 so we're lacking there on top of that this is an 82 mil filter thread it's actually wider than most full frame 70 to 200s it's a heavy beast of a lens and you also have to keep in mind there's no weather sealing and there's no image stabilization in this lens so we're losing some perks we're not really getting the ruggedness that we're assuming with pro lenses and we're not really saving any weight on this I know you're going to say, well, we get the 1.8 aperture, but when we talk about equivalency, that's kind of going out the window too. Is this 1.8 going to give us thinner depth of field? Well, on this APS-C size sensor, it's roughly going to be equivalent to a 2.8 70 to 200 on a full frame camera. So again, we're basically getting the same thing. Are you going to get faster shutter speeds with this lens? Yes, but then again, you could argue that the full frame could push the ISO a little bit higher and get the same kind of shutter speed with the same kind of image quality. I think we're missing the point. I mean, what really matters is that the 50 to 100 is giving you a professional telephoto lens specifically designed for the smaller sensor. Cost wise it's also very equivalent to a 70 to 200 f4 lens for example or 2.8 lens without image stabilization. So you know overall what are we really gaining? Well we're gonna go take some photos and hopefully we'll find out. This is me keeping bugs off of me while I do this talk. Now, when I can, uh, when I can stop moving long enough to take a photo, 5100 does have beautiful bokeh. I mean, the autofocus rendition is gorgeous. So overall, a nice advantage there on this. All right, guys, now keep in mind that none of these long telephotos are really fantastic for macro work, but I am finding that the 50 to 100, although I'm not gonna get the same focal magnification like I would on a 200 on a full frame camera, I'm actually getting a closer focusing distance. Most Canon and Nikon lenses, just roughly, you're gonna be around 1.4 meters, your close focusing capability. This will push to 0.95 meters, but again, we're not getting the same focal length. Still, you will get slightly closer frames on the Sigma in most cases. It's at least comparable and in some cases a little bit better. So, I mean, that is a nice little plus. All right, guys, so here's my terribly unscientific take on the flare characteristics of the 5100 from Sigma. 
And again, you know, I'm just shooting up here into the trees. We've got some sunlight coming through. I mean, this is how I would shoot and have to worry about flare in a lot of situations. No hood on here, of course. A lot of people are giving the Sigma a really hard time for its flare characteristics. And I, I guess I could agree with that in so far as you've got so many elements in here, it's very easy to see the elements in groups, you know, in your uh, shot. You're gonna get all the green lens shapes like you'd see in a movie when they pan past the sun. Just watch Top Gun again, you'll love it. But you know, otherwise, I'm actually not finding that much flare or ghosting where you get that blown out white corner when the sun's on the opposite side. I'd actually say the Sigma's uh, really controlling those reflections well, great coatings. But yes, you will see the elements very easily if you point your lens anywhere near the sun. Another nice little touch here that I've noticed. I like the collar, you get the clickety stops. I don't know why everybody doesn't do that. It's a simple ball bearing spring system, but whatever, Sigma did it, it works well. All right, guys, so just to give you some context. We did our res tests inside, you know, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot the Sigma 50 to 100 here at 1.8 and at f4. You can see with our beautiful model the examples here of this. Uh, I mean, very impressive. This, this lens is just sharp right where you focus it. And, you know, the one thing that we're finding about the Sigma lenses in general is that their wide open aperture performance is incredibly good. I'm not seeing a terribly appreciable difference between 1.8 and f4. Jordan's eyes are nice and sharp. We're just getting the extra depth of field. Firing here with flash just to make sure it's all lens sharpness and nothing else. But overall, very, very impressed. Now, we'll also decide to take a picture of the globe here. Let's look at uh, Salt Lake City. You know, again, shooting 1.8 and f4 at the corners. Again, you can see the Sigmas handle very, very well. What they seem to be accelerating on is their image quality. They're really catching fantastic wide open performance where they know a lot of people are going to use these lenses. Very usable throughout the entire aperture range. You know what, I'm going to let photographers argue over sharpness all day. Us video guys, we have a different set of requirements. And when I see a new lens, the first thing I do is check out the focus ring on it. And with this guy here, I mean, this might be tough to see from back there. We'll zoom in for some B-roll. Uh, the focus on it, look at that, pulling it one side to the other over 180 degrees on the zoom ring and on top of that it's actually a really well indexed distance marker on it so it makes repeating focus pulls actually really straightforward and comfortable. On the topic of pulling focus, in the 18 to 35, the sister lens to this, we use it all the time and I did notice a little bit of focus breathing with it from time to time but if the 18 to 35 breathes slightly then the 50 to 100 is always desperately gasping for air. I mean if you pull focus from macro to infinity you'll see a huge change in your focal distance. So you need to be aware of this. This isn't a lens. I would do a lot of focus pulls from the background to the foreground and vice versa. I'd still go to the Canon 70 to 200 for that. That's a really good performer in that regard. But this is the perfect lens for a lot of those Super 35 cameras on the market right now. The FS5 we're shooting on now, an FS7, a C100, C300. In all of those, the 1835 and the 50 to 100 are kind of the perfect twin pair if you're just looking for nice bright apertures and a useful focal range. So we'll finish up our review here next to this beautiful lagoon and, you know, talk about the Sigma 50 to 100. At first, when this came out, we were kind of thinking, okay, this is going to be your workhorse zoom. You know, couple with the 18 to 35, this is going to be like having a 70 to 200 on your Nikon or Canon, something we'd rely on for years as our a de facto portrait lens, indoor sports in action, even wildlife with a teleconverter. And having used it, the Sigma 15100 isn't quite that lens. You know, things like the image stabilization missing, things like uh, the lack of weather sealing, and not quite getting that longer focal length that we need is kind of letting it down in that regard. Also, the 1.8, although it sounds exciting, really is fairly equivalent to 2.8 when you look at a full frame camera. So we're not getting that much of an advantage there as well. This is a very cool lens for portraits though. Beautiful soft backgrounds, optically stunning, basically throughout its whole, whole range. That's, that's my favorite part about this lens. It's just optically stunning. And if you were to put this with a Metabones on a mirrorless camera like a Sony or something like that, then yeah, again, we're getting a very interesting lens that's gonna kinda get us into that range. But I think I wanna see a slightly longer focal length, something with image stabilization, a weather ceiling that we can really rely on for APS-C sensors, just hit it out of the park and replace all that stuff. Uh, we're not saving that much bulk in size and weight, so you know what? I'd be okay with going a little bit bigger, getting us some more range, and getting us the ruggedness. But if you're looking for a lens that's fantastic for video, and if you're looking for a lens that's going to give you amazing optical performance, even wide open, look no further than the 50-100. to It's a pretty decent price, and it's optically stunning. Uh, don't forget, guys, check us on Instagram. Subscribe to our channel. Please let us know if you have any questions or comments about this particular lens or any of the others. But if you're going to pair it with an 18-35 to and you're going to stick with APS-C, right now this is probably your best choice for two lenses to cover your entire range. Thanks very much, guys. We'll see you soon.